So on behalf of the Russell Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Princeton University, it's my pleasure to welcome you back. Um, we are behind schedule as normal. So um, I think given the activity that we're going to do today, it's very important for us to introduce the activity before lunchtime. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these incredibly quickly. I don't expect you to understand everything I'm going to talk about. The slides will all be posted online. That will leave us time for the activity. If anyone wants to talk about anything here, please come, let me know, put a question in the speaker question channel. Okay, so the last thing is a linked data environment. So one of the questions that um, people mentioned is will big data kill surveys? And I think that's the wrong question. I think the better way to think of it is like peanut butter and jelly. So for the non-Americans, peanut butter and jelly taste really good together. Um, so I think big data and surveys are like peanut butter and jelly. And the more big data you have, the more surveys you want. Um, so I think we should think of these as complements and not substitutes. So in bit by bit, I talk about two different kinds. Um, enriched, I call it enriched asking and amplified asking. Um, so in one case, uh, you have the big data source and you attach the survey on and you have sort of one survey, perfect, one person in the big data source and one person in the survey and they exactly match together, and then you analyze that whole set of things together. So you can think of this as using the survey to append information to the big data source, or using the big data source to append information to the survey. The second kind of thing is what I had called amplified asking, and this is the example from Josh Blumenstock's work, so I'm going to go through that one in more detail. That one, I think, involves a different set of techniques. It involves some often building a predictive model, so I want to talk more about the second. Even though I think the first is probably more useful in a lot of cases, but I want to spend our time on the second, because I think it requires a slightly different way of thinking about the problem than people are used to. So this is a study we talked about the very first day, predicting poverty and wealth for mobile phone metadata. We have these call records from 1.5 uh, million customers in Rwanda. We have this survey data which measures their poverty. Their poverty is not directly recorded in the call records, but they are potentially related. Then we go through a process of feature engineering where we create one row for each person and one column for each feature. These could be things like calls going out, calls coming in. But then he also created lots of these very complicated features like number of calls uh, on the weekend between people that you call. So for example, in, in social networks, people often think about not just how many friends you have or who they are, but the relationships between your friends. So you could have a feature like that, for example. So there's a very, very large numbers of features. Some of them are created by sort of thinking about what we think the feature should be, and some of them are created in a kind of a semi-automated way of taking features that we think about and then taking them for the weekend, taking them for weekdays, like semi-automated, creating lots, build a machine learning model. We'll talk more about that um, on other days. Then impute, then figure out where everyone lives. These are the results we saw before. This is the ability to do it in sample. These, this is, an, this is um, I think, an important image because this is a result from the paper. It shows that uh, square on the right is a one, by, one kilometer by one kilometer grid. And so you see he is able to, they're able to produce estimates of poverty in extremely small, small regions. And so how accurate are these estimates? And the answer is we do not know because no one has ever produced estimates from regions that small before. These are like 10 houses. So to do the validation, he wasn't able to val they weren't able to validate this fully granular estimate. They have to aggregate to the regional level to do the aggregation. So again, 
Often you can measure something more precisely or differently than anyone has measured before. That creates problems for validation. So one way of getting around that is to aggregate and then compare the aggregates. Um, I love how this combines ready-made and custom-made data. The survey alone would not have been sufficient to produce the high-resolution estimates, and the mobile phone data alone would not have been sufficient either. So this is what you should think of when you think of the future of social research in the digital age. Um, I was recently in Italy, and I was very worried about showing that slide in Italy, but they seem to like it in Italy too. Um, now I want to talk about a couple things about this paper that are not in bit by bit. At least I don't think they are. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind, how did this project start? So I've talked to Josh about this a bunch. And one of the ways it started was churn modeling. So for those of you who are data scientists, you've probably heard about churn modeling. Uh, for social scientists, maybe not as much. Churn modeling is trying to figure out who is going to stop subscribing to your service. So one of the questions you might ask is, how did Josh get access to 1.5 million customers and all of their data? And the answer is, he helps the mobile phone company do their business. So most mobile phone companies want churn models. And so they want to know which of their customers are likely to cancel their subscription. And this is like a pretty natural supervised learning, machine learning process where you have, because they have all of the predictor variables in the records of the calls. And they have the outcome measured because for a lot of their earlier customers, those customers have left. And so given the data they already have sitting on their machines, they can build a pretty good predictive model for who is going to um, stop being a customer. So he did this churn modeling for a bunch of phone companies um, in part to help generate access to data. And then he said, you know what, instead of doing a churn model, I can just do some survey data and try to predict the survey data. It's like a very natural step from a churn model, right? So he has this paper um, from 2014 and the results are very bad. So if you read this paper, you would say, and in fact, I read this paper when it came out, and I thought, wow, this is so neat. Like, combining survey data and a predictive model, it's too bad it didn't work that well. Um, and then, like a year or two later, comes the paper that was in Science, where it worked much, much better. And so there are a number of changes in the way the machine learning happened. There's a couple of other changes in the um, things he was trying to estimate. But I guess the point here, which has also came up some in Jen's talk, is we don't want to just think about, assess things where they are at the very end. We want to think about the process that the researchers went through to get there. And we also want to remember that the way things happen initially is not always the best and final way that they're going to happen. So we should also try not to judge a field on where it is now, but also on the rate that it's changing. So to me, this is one of the most exciting parts of computational social science. It's not that we've necessarily done a bunch of really great things, although I think the field's done some, some good things, but it's the rate of change. So from 2014 to 2016, you see actually dramatic improvements. And like that is not happening as much in other fields. And to me, it's the rate of change that is particularly exciting about computational social science. So, in other words, just because something is not working well now doesn't mean it won't ever work well if we try and make it better. The beginning is not the end. Um, so, then I want to tell you briefly about a follow-up paper that came up in one of the questions about using satellite imagery. So, I want to show you that technique, this um, you know, way of combining some kind of big data source with some kind of survey data with this machine learning recipe, it actually can be quite general. It doesn't just have to be call records. So this is one that uh, uses satellite images. So we're going to see, instead of combining phone and survey, we're going to see satellite images and surveys. Um, so let me just first give you a digression. So this technique that is at the heart of this approach is supervised learning. 
So you have lots of input-output pairs, and you, the goal is to develop a function that will predict an output from the input. This is something that comes up in lots of places in computational social science. It comes up in this Blumenstock paper. This is from chapter two. This is actually from Jen Pan's work about um, social media posts in China and, and the sentiment. Uh, it comes up some in the chapter about mass collaborations. So this is an idea that we see over and over and over again, and we'll get practice with that on Friday. So if you're a data scientist, you're probably used to doing supervised learning. If you're a social scientist, it's actually not that different than what we normally do. Just gonna, you'll find that out more tomorrow. Um, so what if instead of engineering the features, we could just learn the features? So normally we think we have to pick what are the the, the aspects of the input that we want to put into our model. What if we could just learn those automatically? This is what deep learning and other kinds of techniques in this family seem to offer the hope of. Um, I will not teach you all about deep learning in one minute, but I want to say, if you're interested, I think this is a good review article. So, um, basically what we can do is we can this is from Google Maps. This is an image of Kigali, which is in Rwanda, uh, which is where you know this research took place. So this is just anyone with a web browser can get this. So the question is, can we use information from these pictures to try to learn something about the poverty and wealth of these people. So you might say, well, maybe if the roof is made of tiles, they're probably more wealthy than if the roof is made of natural materials, or we can learn things about the building construction, we can learn things about the road. So there is definitely some information here about the wealth of the people in these areas. But it is hard to know if we have no ground truth data that we can try to train to. And so here's where the high quality survey data comes in. So, but the question is what features of this picture should we try to use? So like we could look at this picture and we could think the best thing that's gonna predict wealth is something about the buildings, but maybe it's something about the roads. Or maybe it's something that's hard for us to even understand at all. So what they did in this paper is uh, they basically tried to learn, learn which aspects of this picture were the right ones for predicting poverty. They tried to learn it empirically. So how does this differ from other satellite work? So most people have used this nightlight data. So you can look, this is a picture of Manhattan at night. It's very bright. It turns out that the brightness of an area at night is related to measures of economic activity in that area. The problem with um, night lights is they don't do a great job at the lower ends of separating different kinds of middle and low uh, um, wealth areas. And um, there are other things that are potentially lost at night. And so what this paper does is they take day pictures and night pictures and surveys. They combine these three types of things. So I'm not going to explain exactly how they do it. They explain it in their paper. They start with a pre-trained um, neural network from ImageNet, a different huge corpus of images. Then they use that pre-trained network. They retrain it with lots of times of predicting night lights with day images. Okay. Then they take the features from that model and they try to predict the cluster mean of the survey responses. So basically, <clears throat> they use um, <clears throat> the day-night pairs to try to train the model, and then they use the features from that to try to predict the survey responses. <clears throat> These are the results. So one of the ways this generalizes on Blumenstock is the data sources. Also, they start doing multiple countries. So these are the results from multiple countries. Another way it generalizes is they look at multiple outcomes, so consumption, expenditure, and assets. So the ability to do this depends on the kind of thing you're trying to estimate. So for example, imagine you wanted to estimate someone's political preferences from satellite pictures of their house. 
Like you might be able to do that, you might not. It's something about whether there's a correlation between what your house looks like from space and what your attitudes are. So for some things that may be true, like wealth is probably a pretty good one. For other things, probably not. Also, this is about cluster wealth. So it's like the wealth of the area, not the wealth of the specific person in that house. So a lot of this depends a lot on what exactly you're trying to estimate how well it will work. So this goes beyond the Blumenstock one by looking at more things. And then also it does, you may say, all of these things require you to have survey data in that country to calibrate against. So this is only really telling you about measuring poverty in places where you can already measure the poverty. Right, do you see the circularity here? This is a big problem. So what they did in this paper, which I think is very nice, is they said, let's imagine we train on data from Nigeria and then use that to make estimates about Tanzania. And so you can see that the diagonal of these matrices, um, where the, the model is trained and evaluated on the same country, work the best. But you do have cases where it works some um, when you're extrapolating to a different country. So again, this is an empirical question that we'll have to learn about through many more examples, how well you can train in one setting and, and deploy in a different setting. So all the code to do this is on GitHub. So you all could do this if you wanted. Um, so to wrap up, surveys and big data are complements and not substitutes. Sometimes we do enriched asking where we basically are either appending surveys to the big data source or appending the big data source to the survey. And sometimes we do amplified asking where we don't actually care about what the big data source is at all. You'll notice they never are interested in what is in the survey, in the images themselves, only insofar as it helps to measure the thing that we care about, which is the cluster level poverty. Um, there's more in um, bit by bit, especially in the what to read next section. So uh, I am now going to jump straight into the activity because I want you all to have time before lunch.